Father, you'll watch over us and help us to, to take something that we learn here this evening and use it in our, our everyday life with everybody that we come in contact with. This time, Heavenly Father, we're mindful of, of Larry Martin. We pray that you'll be with him, help him to, to get better and be healed, be free of pain. We pray that you'll be with Howard Baskins and Martha Peden. We pray that you'll watch over them and help to heal them and get better soon. Pray that you'll be with our group that's coming back from Peru today. We pray that you'll watch over them, keep them safe. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned Larry Martin. Um, Scott had told me earlier that he is in Huntsville Hospital. He's not doing very well, having some tests run over there. Is that right, Scott? So, so keep him in your prayers. Investments. So tonight, as you can see, we're talking about money, which is an interesting topic, right? Because if you don't have it, you want more of it, right? And if you've got too much of it, I don't know anybody that thinks they have too much of it. Do you guys know anybody that thinks they have too much? I don't either. So what does the New Testament say about money? Hebrews 13.5 Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Matthew 6.24, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other, or he will be, or he will be, or he will, okay, let me just look it up. I can't even read my own writing. Isn't that bad? I don't have very good penmanship. So Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve, let's see. No, starting at 24. 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Luke 12, 15, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I think that is a very important lesson right there, just in that one scripture. Because how do we measure success today? How does the world measure success? Possessions, right? How many toys you got? I mean, I got a boat, I got a four-wheeler, I got a side-by-side. -side. What do you got? Well, I got a bicycle. Yeah, I win, right? So Jesus says here, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Success is not measured by the toys that you die with, as somebody once said. I don't remember who said that. Somebody did. Matthew 6, 21, this is probably one of my favorite ones. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Now, you guys that are visiting with us tonight, this is a discussion class, so don't be shy about speaking up. Um, so what does that mean? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What does that mean to you when you hear that? Okay. Right, right. It's where you put importance on. Whatever you put your importance on. Now, how would you define treasure? I think when you first read that, typically you think a treasure is what? Money, gold. I think when I hear treasure, I think of pirates. They like, they like to have their treasure. So their heart was in treasure, right? I mean, you think of monetary riches, money, possessions. If that is your treasure, if that's what you aspire to have, then that's where your heart's going to be. For me, that's not my treasure. I mean, is it nice to have money? Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's nice to 
Uh, well, I was going to say it's nice to fly in first class, but I don't think I've ever flown in first class. I've walked through it. You know, when you go, when, you're, when your seat's all the way in the back and you walk through first class and none of them will make eye contact with you because we're in first class, just move on to the back. Because they, they're seated first, right? So they're already in their seats, which I mean, hey, more power to them. But that's not where my treasure is. That's not where my treasure's at. My treasure is in is in other things that really can't be measured by money. So think about that. Think about where your treasure is. Where is your heart? And it's typically with what you treasure. So let's talk about Proverbs. And that's this study. That's what we're studying. It's a topical study of Proverbs and what Proverbs says about all these different topics. So let's look at wealth. Is it wrong to be rich? No? Is it wrong? I mean, is it sinful to be rich? It's not, is it? It's not inherently sinful to be rich. So there are some advantages to wealth. Proverbs 10, 15. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. 1811. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his imagination. 13.8. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. So what is that saying that wealth brings you? Those three scriptures, what does wealth bring you? Or can bring you? Kind of a sense of security? A, a strong city, a city with high walls, that kind of gives you a sense of security, doesn't it? I mean, it's not unbreakable, but if you've got some high walls, I mean, you would feel pretty secure. Um, look at 1420. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. 194. Wealth brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friend. And then also 6 and 7. Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. All a poor man's brothers hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He, he, pursues, he pursues them with words, but does not have them. So what can wealth bring you? Point you to those. What do you? Yeah, friends. Friends. Shallow friends, right? Not real friends, but it can give you the impression that you have a lot of friends. If you've got a lot of money and if you're usually the one, you know, buying everybody dinner, are you going to have a lot of people come eat dinner with you? Yeah, probably so. So wealth can bring you friends or Shallow friends or the appearance of friends. Look at 22 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. So, what can wealth bring you there? If you're the rich person in that relationship, what can that bring you? Power, right? It gives you power. And I mean, we see that today, don't we? We see that today in a lot of different industries, even in politics, um, where if you've got deep pockets, if you've got a lot of money, let's say you're a, a, a donor to a school. I know a lot of colleges before this um, NIL agreement came along. Does anybody know what NIL means? Yeah, name, image, and likeness where they can pay college players for their popularity to advertise for their products. Which I was talking to somebody about this other day. It's like they were doing that all along anyway. Now it's just legal. Right? You just you heard about it a lot before, but um, you take these universities that have these these very, very wealthy donors who donate millions and millions and millions of dollars to these schools. Maybe they're even on a building, 
If they say, hey, I want these walls painted orange, what are they probably going to say? Sure, yeah, we'll paint them orange. Just keep sending that money in. Right, so you have a lot of influence a lot of times with wealth. That can bring a lot of influence. And that's not always good. I mean, it could be bad as well, but typically you have a lot of influence. And then what does that mean when he says, the borrower is the slave of the lender? What does that mean? Exactly. The lender has control over you. If you owe somebody something, then you're in debt to them. So Solomon compares it to slavery. You know, and a, a slave is owned by another person, which we don't have that a whole lot in today's culture. It still exists where people own other people. But when Solomon compares that to, to wealth, and when you're in debt to someone, you're just like a slave to them. It's like they own you in a lot of ways. Now, does that mean borrowing money is wrong? I hope not, because most of us in here who have a mortgage, have a car, I mean, we've borrowed money before. But now, does that mean that we're a slave to the bank? In some ways, because when my paycheck comes in, I've got to make that house payment. We may not eat. You know, we may be eating rice and beans, but the bank's got to have their money. What happens if they don't get it? That yeah, they call and say, "Hey, is something going on? Do we need to just extend your time? We, you know, don't worry about making a payment this month." What do they typically do? If you miss a payment, like on a credit card, if you miss a payment on a credit card, what happens? They charge you more money. Yeah, it's interest. You're paying interest already, and then you're paying a late fee, which I hate late fees. I hate late fees. It's such a way. It's that and speeding tickets are the biggest waste of money because it's so avoidable. It is so avoidable. But I paid a lot of late fees because I'd either forget to pay something. Now, I'm getting to where now I pay everything online, but I pay it the day that it's due. Because if I feel like if I pay it a day or two before, then they're using my money for free, which is what the government does every year when they take taxes out of your check. Keep that in mind, young people, when you start to work. The government's borrowing money from you all year long, and then at the end of the year when you file your taxes and get a return, you think they're giving you some money. That's your money that they're giving you back that they borrowed from you all year. Anyway, that's a different class. But... I think I was trying to make a point somewhere in there. Slave and the lender. That when you borrow money from somebody, you're like a slave to them because they're going to get their money first. Chapter 18, verse Um, the poor use entreaties, but the rich answer roughly. Who can tell me what entreaties means? And it's not a trick question. I didn't look it up. I, can somebody give me another word to describe entreaties? Okay. Flattering words. Okay. Yeah, I knew the second part. I got the, I got the roughly part. But the entreaties is more like you're, I guess you're kind or you're soft-spoken, perhaps. The opposite of rough, I would assume. So that's what he's saying here, that when you have wealth, you can speak more freely. I'm thinking of one particular person, a great example of. He's got more money than probably 99% of the people in the whole United States. And when he speaks his opinion, he... He speaks his opinion. You know what? You know what? Uh, Warren Buffett? Yeah, he does. He's got lots of money. He sure does. And he, he speaks his opinion. You think about most of the people with a lot of wealth. They don't really care what everybody else thinks. Now, if they're still the CEO of a company, 
you know, you, you do have to kind of watch what you say, I think, in a lot of ways. But I think people that are independently wealthy, I'm thinking about Trump, it's who I'm thinking about. He doesn't really mince words a lot. I mean, like him or not like him. And he's loaded. I mean, he's got plenty of money, as far as I know, or at least appears to. But I think when you have that wealth, you can, you can speak roughly. You can speak how you want to speak, and you're not worried as much about what people think. Any more advantages to being wealthy? Anything you can think of that wasn't listed there? Are wealthy people more healthy? Seeing mixed signals back there. Some are nodding yes, some are nodding no. I think they probably can afford better health care in some ways, better medicine. I was talking to somebody the other day, they said their, their medicine each month for their wife, $16,000. Can you imagine? A month. But now somebody that's wealthy, $16,000 is like probably $1.60 to me and you. It's, it's insignificant. So in some ways, Luke, yes, they may be more healthy. But, I, but at the same time, they're humans just like everybody else. They're going to get sick. They're frail just like we are. So a lot of times there's no difference. What's another difference? I mean, what's something, something else? else that wealth does not provide, because it does not provide everything. What's something that none of us can avoid? Death, that's right. That's right. And taxes, well, some people are good at it. If you can afford a good lawyer, a lot of times, you don't pay as much taxes. So I hear, chapter 10, verse 2, treasures gained by wickedness does not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. 11.4, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness, righteousness delivers from death. Riches do not profit in the day of death. So that's something that we all have in common. Everybody that's walking on this earth right now, no matter what you've got in your bank account, every single one of us has a limited time here on earth. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what your bank account is. Death is going to come for all of us. Look at 11.28. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. So wealth can sometimes provide a false sense of, of security. Like we were talking about earlier, a rich man feels like he's in a city with strong walls. But if those walls are made of cardboard, if they're not real, they're really not very safe. So sometimes wealth can provide you with a false sense of security. So how do we get wealth? Look at 13.11. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Chapter 20, verse 21. An inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. 28, 20. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. In 22, a stingy man hastens after wealth and does not know that poverty will come upon him. 2017, bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth will be full of gravel. It's a good description, isn't it? Lars has been making bread. Anybody like sourdough bread? Or is it just me? I love it. Isn't it great? She's been making it. She hadn't made it the last couple of weeks. Something about her starter is not doing like it's supposed to be doing. I don't know.
No, our, there we go. Um, but it tastes really good. I love it. I could eat the whole loaf, especially right when it comes out of the oven. It is so good. So the description here really kind of hits home with me because I can taste that warm sourdough bread in my mouth. But then I imagine, well, what if when I bit into it, it was full of gravel? Is there not a, I mean, can you think of anything worse than biting into something you've got gravel, like sand? Like when you ever go to the beach, you get a snack or something, and you're sitting there, and then it's, everything's all sandy and just gritty. Horrible. I mean, if there was a nothing bunt cake right there and it had sand all over it, I would just pass it up. It's just not worth it. Have you ever had a nothing bunt cake? Anybody? You haven't? Has anybody had one? Tanya, I know you've had some. Are those not the best things in the world? If you ever drive past one, you need to stop. Because they're good. They're real good. And they don't have gravel in them. So, so what, is, what is he saying here in the acquisition of wealth? What, what type of wealth or gaining wealth, what do we need to avoid? He said it, he said it in a couple of different passages. One of, it was hastily. Wealth gained hastily. What does that indicate to you? Well, when wealth is gained hastily. Maybe you won the lottery. We'll talk about that. I've got some things about the lottery that have always been interesting to me. Um, I think of, being, of swindling somebody, of kind of cheating somebody out of something. If you make a lot of money in a short amount of time, um, you know, there's been several movies about Wall Street, you know, and there's, there's a, um, you know, a debate about capitalism and the evils of capitalism and the greed that it causes. Um, you know, there's been several movies made about people who have gotten rich really quick by setting up false companies, setting up false products, running the stock price way up, getting people to invest in it, and then cashing out, and then the bottom falls out. So just a handful of people are get make money, but then everybody that invested loses money. Walker could tell you what a couple of the movies. There was one, I can't think of it. It was, I mean, but it's a true story. I mean, that stuff a actually happens. So that's kind of what I think about when I think about wealth gained hastily, um, kind of getting it dishonestly. What's an honest way? To become wealthy. Work hard. Yeah, that's great. And it seems like in today's culture, no offense to you guys that are teenagers still in high school, but it seems like today our labor force is not wanting to work. Every place I call on, every single place I call on would hire somebody that minute if they walked in and said they wanted a job. Now, it may not be what you want to do. It may just be for $15, $20 an hour, and it may be difficult work. You may have to cut grass. You may have to work, you know, weird hours. But they would hire you on the spot to come in and work. You drive up and down Cox Street Parkway. Almost every single restaurant has what sign in their window. Help wanted. Yeah. I mean, every, it seems like everybody is looking for people to work. Um, I went to a place to eat last night, and the parking lot was, I mean, it wasn't even half full. But there were people waiting outside the door. And I thought, that's weird. They were waiting to get in as if they were on a waiting list. So, so I just, I thought, well, let's just go and check and see what's going on. So anyway, we walk in, and there's empty table after empty table after empty table after empty table. And then they said the wait time was 45 minutes. Why is that? Yeah, they don't have enough staff. They don't have enough people to wait on the amount of tables that they have because they can't find people to work. But that, what scriptures tell us is that is an honest way to gain wealth because we establish there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. But it's where your treasure is, and it's how you accumulate it. And gained gradually. Chapter 23, verse 4.
Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. So we need to keep it in perspective. I love to work. I like to work. I like to make money. I like to spend money. I'm married to somebody that doesn't like to spend money, so it's a great balance. She likes to save money. I like to spend it. Love to spend it. But I like to work, too. I've, there's been times in my career where I've been in between jobs and wasn't working, and that's difficult. It's difficult for me in a lot of different ways, but it's difficult sitting around not doing anything. When people retire, they're used to working. They're used to punching a clock, going to work. A lot of them have difficult times adjusting to doing nothing. So wealth is to be put in perspective. Look at verse 5, same chapter, 23. When you're... When your eyes light on it, it's gone, for suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. What does that mean? Just as quickly as you got this wealth, it can be gone. I tell this story a lot, too. We had a meeting one time in Las Vegas, and the hotel we were staying at, I mean, just beautiful. I mean, immaculate, huge hotel, very luxurious um, it was a, like a national meeting, so it was, I don't know, two or 3,000 of us there. But my district, where we were walking to, to the restaurant together, and the way that these hotels are laid out, if you've never been to, to Las Vegas, what is right in the center of everything? So you've been, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But yeah, you're right. The casino is right there in the middle of everything. Why is that? They don't want you to miss it, and they know wherever you go, you've got to walk through this casino. You've got to walk through it. So we're walking from, from where the rooms are to where the restaurant is. It's about, I don't know, six or eight of us. And, and two of the guys, we're walking past a blackjack table, and they said, hey, let's, let's, play, let's play a couple rounds. So they took out $200 each, took out $200, sat down at the blackjack table, and in less than five minutes... Between the two of them, they had lost $400. Is $100 a hand. They each played two hands, and they lost. So $400, gone. Just like that. So your wealth can be gone just as quick as you gain it. The other thing we were talking about, you mentioned the lottery. I looked up some statistics. Um, you know how much money is spent in the United States on lotteries? Every year? $70 billion. $70 billion is spent on lotteries. And not every state has a lottery. You know, Alabama doesn't have a lottery. So that's, that's a lot of money spent on the lotteries. You know what your odds in winning are if you do play the lottery? Anybody want to guess? Anybody see Dumb and Dumber? I love that. That's such a funny movie. One of my favorite lines in that movie is where Lloyd, you know, the, the Jim Carrey guy, he says, he keeps asking this girl out. And he says, do you think there's, he goes, do you think you'll ever go out with me? And she said, what, 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 are, my, what are my chances of you going out with me? And she said, oh, just one in a million. And he goes, yes! So you're saying there's a chance. So he was hanging on to that one in a million chance that she would go out with him. One in 175 million. That's your odds of winning the lottery if you lay down some money and pay the, pay the, buy the ticket or whatever. One in 175 million. Uh, this was a study that was done in Florida. I think it was 2017. 70% of all the lottery winners were broke in five years. So think about that. Seven out of ten of the people that won money in the lottery Broke in five years. It's been it all in five years. And the, in that same study, it also asked them what their level of happiness was before you won, after you won. For the vast majority of them, it didn't change. If they were miserable before they won the money, they were miserable after they won the money. If they were happy before they won the money, most of them were still the same. 
So money doesn't buy everything. I think a lot of times we see people with money driving in fancy cars, wearing fancy clothes, all kinds of stuff, and we think, they must be so happy. But the reality is, if they're not happy, it's not because of the money. Money's not going to make them happy. It's where your treasure is. So what about poverty? Let's talk about poverty. How do people come become, what's the word for, I'm looking for, how do people become, not poverty is, what is the word? Impoverished. Thank you. Yeah. Both of y'all said that. Good. See, my vocabulary is not real wide. So I'm learning. I'm learning as I go. So how do people become impoverished? Some are born into it, right. Some are born into it. Um, you think of all these, um, these big cities that we have, New York, Chicago, Detroit. So many people are born into poverty. And, I mean, I don't know, but just from hearing people that were there, like Ben Carson is one, if you've ever heard Ben Carson speak. He was born into poverty to a single mother. Um, and he felt like that was, his, that's where, that was his station. And I think so many people that are born into that feel like that is where I belong. That is where I'm supposed to be. So sometimes it's circumstances beyond your control. And one thing is you can't choose your parents. You can't choose where you're born, who you're born to. You don't choose those things. That's just part of the lottery that we're given, that one in 175 million. What else? What are some other ways you can become impoverished? I like that word. I'm going to start using that more. Bad situations. Um, I think of people that live in along the Gulf Coast, Florida, New Orleans. You know, when a hurricane comes through, a lot of times everybody's possessions, what they own, is right there. And... If, unless you have the right type of insurance, what happens when a hurricane comes through and wipes out everything? You have nothing. You have nothing. If your insurance doesn't cover what was lost in that storm, which, come to find out, a lot of people don't have hurricane insurance. They may have flood insurance, but it's classified differently in a lot of policies to where it doesn't, doesn't cover what it's going to cost to make you whole again. So sometimes it's circumstances beyond your control that make you impoverished. What else? Chapter 30, verse 14. Those who, whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives to devour the poor off the earth, the needy from mankind. You know, one knock on capitalism is greed. Right? Does anybody, what was that movie where it was, who was it, some gecko, where he said greed is good? What was that? It was in the 80s. Do you remember? Was it Wall Street? No movie buffs in here. So. Was it Wall Street? Okay, thank you. I thought it was. Anyway, he was, he was this big Wall Street guy. And he said greed is good. Greed makes you hungry. It makes you want to get more. But greed is not really good for everybody, is it? Because you can become impoverished by the greed of others. And now, don't get me wrong, I don't think capitalism breeds greed. I think there are people that are greedy that benefit from capitalism and take from others. That is a fact. But you look at every form of uh, economic situation on the planet, there are ways people are going to take advantage of other people. Socialist countries, communist countries. There's bad people everywhere. So the greed of others can make one impoverished. What else? Missing one big one. Foolishness, very good. That's right along the same lines. Foolishness or 
bad decisions or sinful behavior, your own fault. Your own fault. You can be, become poor because of the own dumb things that you've done or being lazy. Look at chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Is that the first bell? So being lazy is bad. Being lazy is bad compared to the ant. Look at the ant. They work hard. They work hard. And they don't even have anybody telling them what to do. Isn't it amazing how they do that? Does anybody ever have ants in your house? We have them in the spring, those little bitty tiny ants. I don't know where they come from, but it's like at the same time of year, they always seem to kind of get in the house somewhere. But they all know. They all just follow right in line. I think they leave some kind of trail or something, don't they, that their little bitty antenna can pick up on? I don't know. But being lazy is bad. Ignoring good advice, drunkenness, we talked about that. Was it last week we talked about alcohol? Or was it the week before? Drunkenness, that's bad. You can spend all your money on alcohol, and then what do you got? A hangover. And you're broke. So, what about uh, generosity? What are we commanded to do? Look at chapter 28, verse 27. Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. So we're supposed to be generous. Where did we get everything that we have? God. When you put that in perspective, when you think of everything that I have has been given to me by somebody else, so it's not really mine, how can you deny somebody else that needs something, that needs food, that needs clothing? I mean, as Christians, that's what we're supposed to be, is generous. We're supposed to be a giving people. You can also honor the Lord. And being generous also does what for you? What does is, what is giving something to somebody do for you? Exactly. It makes you feel good. Now, see, I've always had a conflict there. Am I being selfish because I'm being generous because it makes me feel good? Is that selfish to do that? Because I like feeling good. So I like being generous. I like doing stuff for people. So am I doing it for selfish reasons or am I doing it because I'm supposed to? Something to think about, right? Something to think about. So greed is bad. We talked about that. Um, the last couple of things, the thoughts I want to leave you with, Proverbs 22, 2, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. Proverbs 14, 31, who, he who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him has mercy on the needy. Anything else? Okay. Thanks for your comments. Appreciate it. See you next Wednesday, Lord willing.